and it's just wonderful to be back. Absolutely wonderful to be back. So um, the book comes out tomorrow, but uh, the book started 10 years ago in Franschhoek in South Africa on the other side of the world. I arrived to do a book festival and wonderful experience to be able to travel and talk about storytelling. And I knew very little about the history of that part of the Cape. And I was coming into the town. And as we came along, I noticed a sign at the side of the road that said Longadoc. It was spelt with a Q, but it was still Longadoc, which is the region in Southwest France that I write about all my historical fiction in a way, a love letters to Carcassonne and Toulouse and the Longadoc. And then we kept on going. And I started to notice that the names of the wine farms were not in Cosa, not in Afrikaans, not in English, but in French. They were called La Grande Provence or Petite Provence. And this I started to smell a rat. And then finally we got to the small town, beautiful white Dutch cable buildings. Uh, and the main street was called Huguenot Street. And I knew nothing about the history of that part of uh, South Africa. But when I had a moment, I went to the museum at the end of the road, the Huguenot Museum at the end of the road. And I went in and started to read the interpretation on the walls and discovered this, that in the 17th century, after many, many refugees, Huguenot refugees had left France after hundreds of years of fighting, 1688, finally the revocation of religious freedom in France. They had gone to all sorts of places as refugees, but very predominantly England as it then had been, and now it was becoming England and Scotland. And of course, the Netherlands, the Low Countries, Amsterdam, Utrecht, Rotterdam. And there they had been welcomed. You know, little, little Holland, if you like, became a world power, partly because they welcomed in the refugees, the Huguenots from Paris, who brought with them their skills. And the people who were running the Cape, the people who had stolen the Cape uh, from the people whose land it was, realised that the land, the Dutch East India Company, realised that the land in the Cape was very similar to the land in Languedoc in southwest France. And that being so, maybe, they thought, we could start planting vines here and make our own wine rather than shipping our wine all the way from Amsterdam and Rotterdam, all the way over the coast around Scotland because the channel was infested with pirates and they would often stop in the Canary Islands and then carry on down to the Cape um, and then go on to their so-called territories and colonies in the Far East. And so a letter went back from Cape Town to Amsterdam, to the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company saying, if there are any in our city, refugees from the southwest of France and the south of France who are winemakers, who would like to chance their arm on going to the other side of the world, we will pay for your passage on a ship. We will pay for your family to go with you. We will pay for a French pastor to administer to your spiritual needs. And we will, when you arrive, sell you <laughs> very cheaply, uh, tools to, to, to grow vines, we will sell you vines, we will give you a, a bit, bit of land. And out of that, seven families, seven brave families accepted the invitation and they sailed. One of those ships was a ship called the Berg China that landed in the Cape on the 4th of August, 1688. And they made their way through Drakenstein and Pahl and Stellenbosch and finally to their way in Franschhoek. So, as a writer of historical fiction, I put imaginary characters in front of real history. I write stories of war and the consequence of war, peace and the consequence of peace, faith and the consequences of faith. And I write stories about the Huguenot diaspora, about people being forced to leave that the land that they love and find a new way of finding a home and living somewhere else. And of course, this is all fascinating. And if you're passionate about history, and I'm sure many of you are, just reading the interpretation on the wall of a museum can just set your world alight. But as a storyteller, that's not enough. There needs to be something that you can say that is more than simply the history itself. Because historical fiction, if it's anything, and why I think it matters, is about standing in other people's shoes. And it's about slipping between the gap of what we know and what we can imagine from history. So the moment came when I went outside of the museum into the graveyard. 
and I walked under the extraordinary blue sky in and out of the graves and I saw the French names, the de Villiers, the Dutois, the Jourdains, the Joubert's. And I saw all of the ways that those names started to be lost where the husbands died and the women then married an African settler or possibly a Lutheran settler, but still those French names were still there. And then the moment, the moment that every novelist wants when they're writing. I looked up and I looked up at the mountains that ring the town. There's like a beautiful wall of mountains, the Franchuk Mountains that surround this wonderful, once a frontier town. And those mountains, you know, they look like the mountains of Languedoc. They look like the mountains of the Ariège, where all of my historical characters have walked in many different periods of time, in the medieval time, in the 14th century, in the 19th century, in the modern day. And I suddenly thought this, what would it have felt like to have been a woman who had grown up your whole life hearing about the story of the land you were forced to leave, your family was forced to leave. If you had heard your mother and grandmother, great-great-grandmother, and the generations of women's stories going back 300 years from 1862, which is what it is now as you stand in the graveyard, to 1562 on the eve of the wars of religion that were to destroy France and rip the country in half and divide it into two sets of enemies, if you like, Catholic on one side and Huguenots on the other. But what if you'd grown up all of the time hearing those stories and you found yourself here and you looked up at those mountains and you thought, I could belong here. And that was it. That was where the beginning for a series, four books, started because I wanted and listening to the extraordinary story of Little Amal and the power, the importance of uh, the Sangat theater and the way that sometimes experiences that are very difficult to process. When you have theater, when you have artists, when you have puppetry, when you have painting, when you have dance, when you have music, when you have novels, sometimes the stories that matter most to us and we most want to absorb, the big emotions that matter, you can sometimes work more easily with on the pages of a novel because what happens there is that it no longer becomes a story about refugees. It no longer becomes a story about religious civil war. It no longer becomes a story about diaspora. It becomes a story about one girl and one boy and them falling in love and their families and their enemies and the generations that go down reliving those histories. So once I'd got this idea, I decided that I needed to go back to the beginning, of course, and I went back to the beginning of the Wars of Religion, 1562, uh, the 1st of March, a massacre that happened many, many, many hundreds of miles away from Carcassonne, where my lead family were living. Because what matters in religious war is that it is never about faith. It is always about power, about influence, about manipulation. It is always about demonizing the other. It is always about making people feel that they have to, for their own safety, possibly for their own life, decide that someone who is not the same as them is their enemy. But at the beginning of the wars of religion, and they were absolutely prosecuted, if you like, by a triangle at court, um, a rich Catholic family, the Guise family, Catherine de Medici and her sons repeatedly being the king, and the leaders of the what were called the war Huguenots, Coligny, all of these people at court were fighting for power and for prominence and for influence. But ordinary people in ordinary streets in Carcassonne, they wanted, and I still believe this despite everything, that most people want to live side by side with their neighbors. And so my lead character, Minu, in the first book, The Burning Chambers, goes to work that first morning in a bookshop, not knowing of the massacre many, many hundreds of miles away, but saying hello to her Jewish neighbors, to her Catholic neighbors, she's a Catholic, to her Protestant neighbors. In the City of Tears, which is the second book and follows on from that, it starts 10 years later. Uh, the royal family are prosecuting a wedding, and I say prosecuting because it has been very forced through by two powerful queens, Catherine de Medici and Jeanne d'Albret. There will be a wedding in Paris in August 1572 between the Huguenot uh, King of Navarre, Henry of Navarre, and the Catholic. Marguerite de Valois, who is the daughter of Catherine de Medici and sister to the king. My family, the Joubert family, I took the name from the graveyard, are trying to decide whether to go. 
Now, of course, any of you who know your history will at this moment be shrieking, do not go to Paris, because you will know that the most notorious engagement of the wars of religion is the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where maybe as many as 3,000 Huguenots were massacred in the course of the night on the 24th of August, 23rd to the 24th, and there were maybe 70,000 Huguenots were massacred the length and breadth of France in copycats that followed. But my family do go, and what is extraordinary about writing historical fiction is this, that sometimes you have all the research, you have the idea of the tone and the character of your novel, but you don't yet quite know what book you're writing until you're doing it. And when my family get to Paris, what I discovered was that it actually wasn't a story about war, and it was a story about being refugees and fleeing because they flee to the city of tears itself, Amsterdam. It actually was a story about a missing child. And this too is what matters about historical fiction, that we tend to think sometimes in the past that they did not feel things in the way that we would. But of course, we know that's not true because again, that's a version of demonizing the other. Again, it's the idea that they don't think like we do and therefore they don't matter as much. But people will look back on us in a hundred years time and maybe think some of our emotions didn't matter so much or we didn't feel things so keenly, but we know we did. So what I thought would happen in the City of Tears when you are in the middle of brutal and violent and absolutely crushing history, the massacre that will go down in history as a turning point in the fortunes of Europe. But what matters is that your child has gone missing. So I won't tell you anything else about the City of Tears, which I'm holding up because uh, we, you know, earlier uh, we were talking about Blue Monday, but I think it should be Orange Monday. Um, but the story is very dear to me because as I started to research, as I started to look into how many people went to Amsterdam, the ways in which French uh, Huguenots were pushed out of their own country, I felt as always, you know, the classic uh, Brothers Goncourt comment about history being a book that is yet to be written and a novel being history that could have been. And I think what matters about historical fiction is we learn the emotions that matter. We stand in other people's shoes. We can see our own lived experiences reflected back at us. But more importantly, we learn about empathy and compassion and the idea that every single person who has ever been forced from their home now, yet to come, sadly, and in the past, we all share that same commonality of humanity. And we want to be people that will reach out to other people and give them a home if they haven't got one and open up our doors. So if you buy uh, any of the books this evening, do support Newnham Bookshop. Uh, it's an incredible independent bookseller um, and they deserve all the support that any of us can give. But it's been a great pleasure to be here on the eve of my publication back at wonderful 5x15 and to share the platform, the screen, uh, with such wonderful other writers. But for now, uh, this is me, not from the City of Tears, but from my desk in Sussex, saying thank you for listening and hope to be back in real life uh, very soon. Thank you. <laughs>